in our hearts and our voices as we worship together this morning. We lift up the song, the song of the saved. It's the song of the one who's been rescued from the grave. So sing it out loud, sing it out strong.
And it's so good to see all of you here this morning at First Baptist Tanner. Welcome. And uh, what a joy it is to see each of you in the Lord's house this morning. Would you join me for a word of prayer as we just ask God's blessings on our service today? And this morning as we pray, uh, I just, uh, you know, I know that in this room, uh, there is no doubt a multitude of needs. I've already spoken with people this morning who've shared with me that uh, they have certain prayer requests or certain needs. Maybe they're anticipating medical procedures, anticipating reports and results from those. Some that are dealing with the loss of loved ones and going through grief. And, and then there are others that just have some, some personal struggles, maybe in their home or in their family or in their life. I want us to take a moment and just pray. Pray for one another. I believe in the power of prayer. And we just sang about how the Lord comforts those in need. And so if you know someone that has a particular need this morning that maybe you're aware of, would you just pray for them during these moments? You know, the Lord taught us that he said, my house will be called a house of prayer. And I just want you to pray for someone today. And if you do not know of anybody, why don't you pray for the person that's sitting in front of you? You might not even know who that person is or the person sitting behind you uh, or next to you. you. You may not even know who it is, but just pray that God would minister to their needs. God would bless them. I want us to take just a moment and pray for those around us. Would you do that? Heavenly Father, we thank you that we can come into your presence. Sometimes, Lord, it's just good for a church just to re recall the words in Scripture that says, Be still and know that I am God. And in the busyness of a, of a hectic week of schedules, perhaps of travel, vacation, work, all the things that we do to just be able to come together and pause and just speak to you, not because uh, we deserve any, anything that, that you want to give us, but, Lord, because of your grace and because of the promises of your word, which teach us to share our burdens with one another, to cast our cares upon you, that if we, that we have not because we ask not, that if we come, into you, come to you in faith, believing that you will hear and respond, where you taught us to knock and the door would be open to seek and we would find to ask and it would be given to us. You promised, Lord, that just as you clothe the lily of the field and feed the fowl of the air, even more so do you provide for the needs of your children. And Lord, it's just in the spirit of, of recognizing your grace and based upon the promises of your word that we come to you. And I, I feel like, Lord, that just now you answered some prayers. I, I feel, Lord, that, that you've done miracles in our midst just because your people have asked you. And we thank you for that. I pray that you'd give to people peace that passes understanding and that they would be aware of your presence and that they would also realize that even though weeping may endure for a night, joy comes in the morning. So bless your people today, Father. And thank you, Lord, for giving us a moment to speak to you and to allow you to speak to our hearts. Now we pray that everything we say and do in our worship today would be pleasing in your sight and would be a blessing to you. For we ask this in Jesus' name, amen and amen. Well, good, so good uh, to, to be with you and to share together the love that we have for one another. And, and I just wanna say, if you're visiting with us today and perhaps you're here for the first time or the first time in a long time, we'd love to have a record of your attendance. And there's a connection card that's attached to the Sunday Bulletin. If you would be so kind as to give us a little bit of information about yourself, you can tear that off, place it in the offering plate later in our service. 
and we would indeed be very grateful for that. And uh, just give us a record of your presence with us. Thank you for helping us with that. I know our people love fellowship, and so we're going to take a moment and speak to those around us. Let's stand together and greet those, and especially our guests, church. Let's do that.
our pastors already prayed this morning. We are needy people. And Father, we know that our strength comes from you, Father, the giver and the sustainer of life. Thank you, Father, that you love us. You know everything about us, and yet you still love us. You still care for us. You know when we're happy, when we're sad, when we're full of joy, Father. Thank you, everything about that. Thank you for being that very present help in times of need. Of course, in your precious name, I pray. Well, amen. Would you take your Bibles, please? And turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 12 for our Bible study this morning. 1 Corinthians, the 12th chapter. Well, verse 1 has good instructions for the church. Uh, And we're we're going to we're going to look carefully at this uh, over the next few weeks. But at 1 Corinthians chapter 12, the Apostle Paul, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, writes to the church at Corinth, and this is what he says. Now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I would not have you ignorant. Now, if this is the first Sunday that you've been with us in quite some time, uh, you need to understand that we have been studying uh, the, the, these things that deal with the spiritual truths, the scriptural truths that deal with the ministry of the Holy Spirit in our lives and in our church. A wonderful passage of scripture that we looked at in depth is found in Ephesians chapter 5 where Paul said, Be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be ye filled with the Holy Spirit. And I spent several weeks talking about that and the passages that follow. And if you're interested in more information, you can go to our website and you can access our resources and then under that, sermons, and you can see and hear those messages. We learned that being filled with the Holy Spirit is not a matter of us getting more of God's Spirit. It is a matter of God's Holy Spirit getting more of us. (laughs) If you really boil down everything the New Testament teaches about being filled with the Spirit, you really come to understand that that it's a truth that's connected to the Lordship of Jesus. It's really all about Jesus being Lord of our lives. It's not a matter of us receiving more of God. It's a matter of God receiving more of our surrender to him. But now, God gives to us the Holy Spirit for a number of reasons. He's to guide us. He teaches us in all truths. He points us to Jesus. We studied about those things. But one of the things that the Holy Spirit wants to do that I want us to spend a few weeks talking about is to equip us for ministry. If I were to say, how many ministers do we have in our congregation this morning? I wonder how many would raise their hand. How many ministers do we have in church today? Well, the truth is, if you're a born-again believer, you should raise your hand because you are a minister. Sometimes we distinguish between clergy, professional, paid ministry, and lay people, but the truth is, We're all ministers. You know that, right? That God's called each of us to a particular area of ministry. We're to be serving one another, the body of Christ. We're to be serving others. We're all ministers. Now, it is true. You pay me as a staff person. You you pay me to be good, right? Right? And see, you all are just good for nothing. (laughs) But God has called us to serve him, and he's given us gifts. We're going to be studying about spiritual gifts and how God wants to use each of us in his church for a particular ministry. Henrietta Mears said... I believe that it is impossible for any Christian to be effective either in this life or in his service 
unless he is filled with the Holy Spirit who is God's only provision of power. Charles G. Finney said, Christians are as guilty for not being filled with the Holy Spirit as sinners are for not repenting. They are even more so for as they have more light, they, have, they are so much more guilty. So the whole purpose in us taking all the weeks that we did for me to introduce to you the Holy Spirit, who he is and what his ministry is in our life and what it means to be filled and controlled with the Holy Spirit is so that we understand that God wants us to be totally surrendered to the Lordship of Christ and to be used by his Holy Spirit to minister in the body of Christ. Years ago in New York City, there was a group of ministers who were planning a citywide crusade. This was uh, back in the latter part of the last, the first part of the last century. And they were planning this crusade and they met to select, they were going to select the evangelists that would lead them in that crusade. And the majority of the ministers that were there really wanted D.L. Moody to come and preach this great crusade. He was a great evangelist. He was a great teacher. He was anointed by God. But one of the ministers in that group wanted another evangelist. And he got frustrated with those guys that were just wanting D.L. Moody. And in exasperation, he said, Moody, Moody, Moody. He said, that seems to be uh, all you guys are, are talking about. Does D.L. Moody have a monopoly on the Holy Spirit? That's what this guy asked. True story. And the other ministers looked at him and said, no, Mr. Moody does not have a monopoly on the Holy Spirit, but we believe the Holy Spirit has a monopoly on him. <laughs> and you know, that's really what God wants to do in each of our hearts and each of our lives. That's how he wants to empower us to do the work that he's called us to do. Now, this is going to be a fun process as you understand how God wants you to use you in ministry at First Baptist Tanner and through First Baptist Tanner. And so we're going to talk about what, what the spiritual gifts are and how to discover, in a, few, in a couple of weeks, we're going to talk about how to discover your spiritual gifts. And we're going to try to give some definition to that. And it's important that we know that because the Apostle Paul said in verse 1 of chapter 12, concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I would not have you ignorant. Paul said, I don't want you to be ignorant about this particular subject. I remember when I was in high school, I worked at an inner city mission in Montgomery, Alabama. Uh, I did an internship during the summer and there was a lady there who was a home missionary. She was an elderly lady. She was approaching, she was close to retirement. Her name was Gladys Farmer. Some of you that have worked in WMU or mission organizations for many years might remember that name. She was one of our Alabama Baptist home missionaries employed by the Home Mission Board. We call it now the North American Mission Board. But Miss Gladys Farmer, I worked for her as a teenager. I was in school and I was doing an internship there in this inner city mission. And I asked her one day, Miss Farmer, why did, you why did you not ever get married? And she says, well, Gary, I'm just obeying the scripture. I said, what do you mean? And she says, well, it says in the Bible, I would not have you ignorant brethren. <laughs> I, uh, uh, but there is a comma there. And Paul's wanting us to know that this is a subject that he does not want the church to be ignorant of. As a matter of fact, there's really four areas in the scripture that we're given the admonition, I do not want you to be ignorant. One of those has to do with God's dealings with the Jewish people. There's a clear verse where he talks about, I don't want you to be ignorant in this particular area. God's dealing with the Jewish people. And there's another place where uh, it says he does not want us to be ignorant of the devices of Satan. And then there's another one where he talks about he does not want us to be ignorant about the second coming of the Lord Jesus. But in this passage, he says, now here's another area I do not want the church to be ignorant of. I do not want you to be ignorant concerning spiritual gifts. Now in verse 1 in the King James, he says, now concerning spiritual gifts. In many of your translations, it says that. The word gifts right there is not actually in the original text. 
The Greek word for the word spiritual is pneumatikos, and that word literally means spirituals. I don't want you to be ignorant of these spiritual matters, these spiritual gifts. Now, in the context we're going to learn, he is talking about gifts, but he's not talking about material gifts. That's the point I want you to understand. The emphasis here is on spiritual. Now, if I were to tell you the title of my sermon this morning is how you can receive the gift of a brand new Mercedes Benz. I imagine some of you would want to slide your seat up a little closer and listen very carefully because I'm going to tell you how to receive the gift of a brand new Mercedes Benz. Because material possessions have an attraction to us. But I want you to know, Paul is not talking about a material possession here. We need to listen even more carefully and more closely because he is talking about a spiritual gift. This is something God wants to give to his people. There's nothing wrong with material gifts. But what I'm talking about is far more valuable. Somebody said one time, we're so heavenly minded that we're no earthly good. They said that about Christians. But I want to tell you, I've been working with Christians a long time. <laughs> and the more I work around church folks and the more I work around Christians, sometimes I think that it's just the opposite is true. That we're so earthly minded that we're no heavenly good. <laughs> now, what is a spiritual gift? Well, the best way to define a spiritual gift is very, very simple. It is a supernatural ability that God has given to you as a Christian, as a child of God, It is a supernatural ability that God has given to you to minister to the body of Christ. So the first thing I want you to understand is we're not talking about a material gift. We are talking about a spiritual gift. But now there's something, there is something intriguing about this matter because we're we're talking now in the realm of the supernatural. I want you to look in verse 4 of that same chapter. 1 Corinthians 12 and verse 4, if you still have your Bibles open there. He said, now, there are diversities of gifts, but the same spirit. Now, in this passage, he does use the word gifts. And it is the Greek word charismata. He says there's all types of different gifts. And this Greek word charismata is the word that we get our English word charismatic from. How many of you have ever heard in the church vernacular, in, the, in Christian conversation, somebody say, well, he's a charismatic Christian, or he's, he, he, he's part of the charismatic movement. Is, is that verbiage just foreign to you, or has anybody ever heard something like that? Raise your hand if you have. Use the word charismatic. Well, back during my... Uh, younger years, there was something called the charismatic movement in the Christian community where there was an emphasis on the Holy Spirit and the gifts of the Spirit and being baptized with the Spirit and the evidence of the Spirit. And, And there was an emphasis on things like healing and miracles and speaking in tongues, all of which are gifts of the Holy Spirit. We're going to get, we're going to deal with those later. But there was an inordinate emphasis uh, on those matters, and it was called the charismatic movement. Now, the word charismatic, just uh, in in the English language, it carries the idea of energetic, appealing, a magnetism, perhaps a certain charm. Uh, People said about John F. Kennedy, Kennedy that he was a charismatic individual. He was a charismatic president. Uh, they said the same thing about Ronald Reagan. And they say the same thing about other popular people in our, in our culture uh, over the years, that they are just a charismatic person. Well, they're not talking about anything spiritual in that, in that regard. They're just saying they, they have a lot of energy. They, they have a lot of appeal. They have a lot of magnetism about them. But now, in the Christian vernacular, in the scripture, whenever the Bible talks about this matter of being charismatic, it's talking about one who has been gifted by the Holy Spirit. The word charismatic actually comes from a compound Greek word, charismata. The word charis means is translated in the New Testament, grace. The second part of that word is translated grace gifts, if you will. So charismata is a grace gift, a free gift. It's something that you do not earn, you do not deserve. It is something that the Holy Spirit, God himself, gives to his children. And so that being said, 
I want you to know, First Baptist Tanner, that you have a charismatic preacher, all right? And you ought to be a charismatic member. You, I hope you are. Because we've all been given, if you're a born-again believer, you've been given a charismata. You've been given a grace gift. It's interesting, over the years, there's been two extremes as to how people have responded to this teaching. You know, the devil's always trying to take a great truth from the Bible and distort it and use it to confuse Christians. Uh, so you've got, in the Baptist church in particular, because that's been my world for the most part, uh, you've got those who I think would be best described by charisphobia. <laughs> now, you know what phobia means, right? Phobia means fear. You have autophobia, fear of heights. You have hydrophobia, fear of water. You have claustrophobia, uh, fear of confined spaces. I, I believe there are some believers in our Baptist churches that have charisphobia. Uh, they're, they're just afraid sometimes to talk about this matter of spiritual gifts because it does deal in the area of the supernatural. And we have a tendency to fear anything that we don't understand or have really never experienced. But then there's another extreme that I've seen practiced in some churches. On one end, you've got charisphobia. On the other end, you have charismania. Those who go too far. And they're always talking about the Holy Spirit and they're always talking about the second blessing. And they're always talking about the evidence of being filled with the Spirit. And you'll hear some of them talk about being slain in the Spirit and laying on of hands and healings and, and speaking in tongues and, 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 they, and they just get overly consumed with those ministries and gifts, a distortion of the gifts of the Holy Spirit, in my opinion. And some of you may hear of, uh, of churches that practice these things. Uh, most, uh, most churches, most people that, that are of that persuasion, uh, they're more interested in gratifying themselves than ministering to others has been my observation. And the gifts are given to minister to others, uh, not to bring any kind of sense of pleasure or uh, to, to oneself. Stephen Olford, who's, who's a great preacher, uh, uh, just a wonderful uh, exegetical, expositional communicator of the Word of God. He went to be with the Lord not long ago, but Stephen Olford says on once, he says it's like you've got that which is psychic when it comes to things of the Holy Spirit. You've got some which is satanic because it's just a distortion of biblical truth, but he says right there in the middle there is that which is authentic. And I don't want us to be psychic. I certainly don't want us to be satanic. As we study what spiritual gifts are, I want us to find the authentic truth in God's Word about these things. And any time you're in a church where there is an overt emphasis on the Holy Spirit. Now, I've been teaching. I've been teaching for six weeks, uh, six, so far six studies, I believe, on the Holy Spirit. And now we're going to spend a few more on the gifts of the Spirit. But this is for instructional. It's not that we've just come here and camped out and this is where we are doctrinally and theologically as a church. This is a season of instruction, a season of teaching. But if you ever go to somewhere where that's all their focus is, I want to tell you, you need to be very careful because listen, one of the primary roles of the Holy Spirit is to point people to Jesus. Now you go to a church where they're talking about the Holy Spirit, this and the gifts of the Spirit and the, this of the Spirit and that and the Spirit and the manifestation of the Spirit and the baptism of the Spirit and it's Spirit, 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 Spirit all the time. I, I, I would be very uh, cautious. But you go to a church that loves Jesus, talks about Jesus, exalts Jesus and it's just a Jesus church, then that's the New Testament. Let me tell you why I believe that. Look, if you will, in John chapter 16. Just keep your hand there in 1 Corinthians 12. And look, if you will, in John 16, verse 13. How be it? Now, this is the words of Jesus himself. When he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth, for he will not speak of himself. 
But whatsoever he will hear, that will he speak, and he will show you things to come. Now listen to this. For he will glorify me. He will receive of mine and will show it unto you. Jesus said, he will glorify me. So that's who we are as a church, a church that wants to lift up and exalt the Lord Jesus. But the Holy Spirit is part of the Godhead who enables us to do that in a way that blesses the church and evangelizes the lost. So these gifts, well, they're, 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 they're not material, they're spiritual, and they are supernatural. Now, now th that I, I want you to understand spiritual gifts in contradistinction to talents. Uh, the gifts of the Spirit are not the same as talents. Um, now, talents may be a vehicle to use a spiritual gift, but, but there is a difference. Um, we're going to learn that there's spiritual gift of teaching, of exhortation, of comfort, of edification. There, there's all these different spiritual gifts. Uh, Brother Rex is exceedingly talented. Um, he is a talented singer, but singing is not his spiritual gift. That's his talent. He's a fabulous guitar player, but playing the guitar is not his spiritual gift. That is his talent. Now, he may exercise that talent. Uh, he may exercise his spiritual gifts through those talents. But there is a difference between a talent and a spiritual gift. I just want you to understand that. But, but, uh, because non-Christians, people who are not even believers, can have talents, right? Now, you've heard some guys that were just the antithesis to a born-again believer who could really play guitars, right? I mean, they're, they're not believers, they're not Christians, but they have a great talent. Or they could sing. But only Christians have spiritual gifts. Talents depend on natural instincts, but the gifts of the Holy Spirit have to do with spiritual abilities and spiritual endowment. Talents inspire or entertain on a natural level, but gifts relate to building up the body of Christ. Something supernatural happens in the one who is ministering when a gift is exercised. Don't misunderstand. God gives people talents too. He even gives people that are not his children talents. I believe every talent that anybody ever has is God-given, but it's not the same as a spiritual gift. Talents are given by the common grace of God. Gifts are given by a special grace of God. Talents sometimes are innate in a person's life at birth. Spiritual gifts are only given at spiritual birth. So there's a difference. Just don't, I just didn't want you to confuse the two. Uh, they're, they're both given by God, but, but they're not the same, and they're not for the same purpose. Uh, just another point in this introductory message where I'm just trying to um, help us not to be ignorant <laughs> concerning spiritual gifts. Uh, I, I want you to understand that it's different than the fruit of the Spirit. Uh, do not confuse, do not confuse the gifts of the Spirit with the fruit of the Spirit. Uh, let me, let me uh, reference you to Galatians chapter 5. Uh, keep your hand here in 1 Corinthians and look over in Galatians chapter 5. And the Bible here talks about the fruit of the Spirit in verse 22. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance, Against such there is no law. So the Bible talks about gifts of the Spirit and it talks about fruit of the Spirit, but they're not the same. Gifts have to do with service. The fruit of the Spirit has to do with character. 
The gifts are a means to an end. The fruit of the Spirit is the end itself. The gifts of the Holy Spirit are what a man has, but the fruit of the Holy Spirit is what a man is. And every variety of the fruit of the Spirit should be in every Christian. Did you know all of these love, joy, peace, long-suffering, meekness, all, the, all of those should be reveal, revealed because they're the, they're the qualities of the character of Christ and we ought to be Christ-like and the only way we can be Christ-like is if Jesus is Lord of our life. If we're filled with his Holy Spirit. So it has to do with character. The fruit Every Christian should have all the variety of the fruit of the Holy Spirit. But now every Christian should not have all of the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Do you know that? We're going to learn that each one of you has a spiritual gift. Each one of you. But none of you have all of the spiritual gifts. Or you'd be a church. <laughs> you'd, you'd be a church of yourself. <laughs> We're going to learn from 1 Corinthians 12 that God gives us. Now, you may have more than one spiritual gift, but, but no one has all the gifts because then nobody, you, you, we wouldn't be necessary. <laughs> but God's placed us in the body of Christ and each of us have a different place in the body of Christ. We're going to study that next week. Uh, he even uses an analogy of, of the body. You know, some are a hand, some are a foot, you know. Some, some may be a mouth. Uh, there's different parts of the body. Some may be an arm, some may be legs, who knows? But, but, but they all fit together to make up the body of Christ and to accomplish his will. We'll excavate that gold mine of biblical truth a little more next Sunday morning. But let me just conclude with, with this truth. Go back to 1 Corinthians 12. And, and let me put this in your heart about spiritual gifts, church. In 1 Corinthians 12, look, if you will, in verse 7. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to everyone to profit with all. In other words, it's to benefit the whole church. That's the reason you have a spiritual gift. God did not save you to sit and soak. God saved you to serve. God wants you to serve him. And he has given you a gift to benefit the whole church. In plain English, you ought to be a blessing to everyone else in the church by the exercise of your spiritual gift. So it's to serve. So here's a couple of truths I want to put in your heart. Number one, spiritual gifts are tools. They are not toys. I've been in some churches where you would think they were a toy. It was just given for people's own personal pleasure and enjoyment and whatever. That's, that's not the biblical concept of a spiritual gift. They are not toys. They are tools. Here's another truth. They are not for our enjoyment. They are for our employment. Spiritual gifts are to be used in the ministry that God has called each of us to be a part of and called our church. The gifts of the Holy Spirit are not evidence of being filled with the Holy Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit is evidence. But don't let anybody ever tell you that any gift is evidence Gifts are not given for evidence. They are given for equipment. And that's why I started the message by saying, how many of you are ministers? The truth is, we're all ministers. We all have a ministry. God has saved us. He's given us a gift. My job as pastor is, is not to do your work of ministry. My my work of ministry is to help equip you to do your work of ministry. I've got my own ministry. 
And the, the pastor is not a hireling paid to do the ministry for the church. He is called to help equip you to do the ministry of the church. That's why God doesn't just take us to heaven once he saves us. I mean, why wouldn't, I mean, why wouldn't God just take us on to heaven once we ask Jesus to come in our heart? It's because he's got a work for us to do. He's got a mission for us to accomplish. He's got a ministry that he wants you involved in. A friend of mine was telling me about a pastor friend of his who on his church roll, he literally had written out by a number of his church members the initials F-B-P-O. True story. My pastor friend said he was looking at the church roll of this uh, pastor and he said, why do so many of these people have the initials F? B P O out beside their name. And his friend said, Oh, that stands for burial purposes only. Did you know that's a lot of church members are members of a church just for that for burial purposes only? Another church had the word, had the letter C E O by a, a, a whole list of church members. Somebody asked, What does the C E O stand for? He said, Christmas, Easter only. I know churches are full of CEOs sometimes. God has a ministry and he wants you to use the gifts that he's given you to accomplish his work in and through the ministry of the body of Christ. So it's an exciting journey. God saved us, filled us with his spirit and has given us gifts. And we'll learn more about it in the days to come. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for this word from your word. And just, Lord, for these truths that you clearly said in your words, you did not want us to be ignorant concerning. So I pray that as we study about these truths, that you'll raise up servants and leaders and people who will be exercising their gifts, that we might not only be a blessing to one another, but to our community and especially to you. So give us your insight as we study these truths. And Lord, I pray that if there's someone here this morning who does not know Christ as their Savior, although this has not been an evangelistic message, I believe your Holy Spirit has been speaking to their heart about a need that only you can meet, a need of grace, a need of salvation, a need of forgiveness. And I pray that they would respond to this invitation by surrendering their life to you. And I pray if there are other decisions that need to be made that your Holy Spirit would give direction and guidance to each person. So we ask you to bless now these moments in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to stand in just a moment and sing a hymn of invitation. And I'm going to be here at the front. If God has spoken to your heart about a decision that you need to make, if you want to receive Christ as your Savior, we'll have someone help you and counsel with you. If you want to follow the Lord in believers' baptism or unite with our fellowship, this is an opportunity for you to respond as we stand and as we sing. You come right now. Stand. seated please and I'm going to ask our guys to come to receive our, our offering this morning and um
as they make their way here, I'm going to lead us in prayer. So would you join me, please, as we pray. Father, thank you for the, uh, the, the people in this church, Lord, that, that love you and love this church, that support the ministry of this church, that give faithfully week to week, month to month, as an expression of gratitude for your blessings in their life and in obedience to your command, which teaches us that the tithe is holy unto the Lord. And for others that give, we ask your, your blessings upon them. We're so thankful. And Father, I pray that you'd bless them, that you'd bless their health, their jobs, their homes, their families. And I pray that you'd bless our church and help us always to be good stewards of that which you entrust to us. So we lift this offering to you, Lord. It is an act of our worship on this Lord's day. And we ask you to bless it in Jesus' name. Amen. this morning you um you do not want to miss tonight we have an old-fashioned hymn scene tonight uh just come and uh we've done this for quite a few years now uh in the summer on sunday night we would pick a sunday night and we um just come together and uh brother rex and brother george will be taking your hymn request uh and we will have a good old-fashioned hymn sing so you don't want to miss that i'm looking forward to it um next week uh we will have a bluegrass group um a local bluegrass group by the name of um, Piney Creek that will be here next Sunday night at 6 o'clock as well. So um, you don't want to miss that uh, as well. Be in prayer for our Guatemala mission team as they will be um, departing this week um, on Thursday. So uh, keep them uh, in mind. Um, be in prayer for them. And I'm sure Brother Gary will uh, mention something else about that. Uh, senior adults, uh, you don't want to miss our Amish trip. We're going Tuesday, so if you have not signed up yet, uh, please sign up so that we can uh, make, make the necessary uh, transportation arrangements. Uh, baby shower for Eric and Molly Thigley will be next Sunday, the 28th. A lot of fun with our, our hymn.